My name is Eric Stellwagen, and as Aidan told us, I am president and co-founder of Business Forecast Systems, which is the company that develops and markets the Forecast Pro product line. Um, I have spent my basically my whole professional career in the field of business forecasting, um, and doing so has allowed me to go into really different organizations, probably if I had to count them up, hundreds of different organizations, uh, to look at how they do forecasting and how they solve their challenges. And this has been uh, very useful in terms of understanding uh, approaches and pragmatic ways to, to get a, a forecasting process done. Today's webinar is a, an important one. It's on tracking accuracy. And it's important that we track our forecast accuracy so that we know what's working, what's not, and we can improve our current process, which should, should always be one of our goals. With me today is Sarah Darren. Uh, she'll be co-presenting the webinar, and Sarah can introduce herself. I'm Sarah Darren, as Eric said. Um, I am a statistician by uh, by training, and I've spent most of my career in doing advanced analytics consulting, I would say. Um, so over 20 years of uh, consulting experience with sales forecasting, regression modeling. Um, like Eric, that has led me into a lot of different organizations across a lot of different industries. So I've seen a lot of um, the different ways that uh, different organizations um, use data to help uh, to help forecast and plan. Um, so at, at Business Forecast Systems, I've actually um, been primarily in product development. So that um, those years of consulting experience and seeing how lots of different companies do things has certainly come in uh, handy at uh, BFS as well. So what we're looking at here is a, a roadmap of what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, clearly we've gone through our introductions. Um, next, we're gonna talk about why you wanna track accuracy. Um, and that really does come down to, you just wanna keep always improving. Then we're gonna look at um, how, how you might measure error. So there are a couple of different ways that you might wanna measure error. There's some pros and cons of each of those and we'll, we'll review those. Then we're going to talk about how to track accuracy. So there are a few different forms of tracking accuracy. Some are more model approached. Um, and another one, which is real-time tracking, which Eric will take us through in detail, is um, really where we come out as, you know, this is what you should be doing in your forecasting process. We're going to talk about um, how you spot problems um, with, when you have are dealing with a lot of different items and SKUs um, and how using accuracy will help you measurements will help you spot those problems and again improve your forecasting process a quick summary and then we'll go into a, a question answer session and again um, if we want to emphasize if we do not get to your question you can certainly expect an answer via email um, following the uh, the webinar so let's get into why track forecast accuracy. Well, I mean, the clear reason, we've already said this, I believe, is to improve your forecasting process. Um, forecasting really should be a continuous improvement process, whether you are just starting your uh, forecasting process or you whether you're running a relatively mature forecasting process. The goal should be to make that process better each forecasting cycle each year. In order to make it better, um, you really need to understand what's working and what's not working. Um, and to understand that, that's where it comes into uh, measuring your, your error and, and monitoring it. Um, the other advantage, really, of measuring your error is it will help you start deciding um, where time and resources are um, useful. You can, once you have those errors, you can start assigning values to the errors and understand what the value add, add the, the money value of uh, forecast improvements can be. Um, and ultimately, you can take that to management and perhaps get more time and resources uh, to invest towards your, your forecasting process. Another good reason to track forecast accuracy is to gain insight into expected performance. So a forecast is typically a, a single number, and that number is almost certainly going to be wrong. There is going to be some difference between what your forecast is and what the actual sales value comes out to be. 
The question is, um, how, how close is it going to be? How close is your forecast going to be to what actually happens? Um, and when you present a forecast to someone, you want to have the ability to give an understanding of what the plus minus range around that forecast is so that they, they, they know what to expect once the, uh, the actual numbers start coming in. The best way to um, get an understanding of uh, expected performance is to look back on the plus and minus in your historical performance. Um, so, so in terms of forecast accuracy, tra accuracy tracking, it's going to help you understand um, how well you uh, should expect to do going forward. To benchmark, people uh, typically want to know if they're good, doing a good job or not relative to, to some benchmark. We're um, often asked questions like, you know, okay, my forecast error is 50%. Is, is that good or is that bad? And that can be a hard question to answer. Um, in, in my consulting background, I had to deal with benchmarks a whole lot. A lot of my clients wanted benchmarks. The problem with benchmarks is, particularly analytics, is even within the same industry, even within the same size company within the industry, every organization is using different kinds of data. They have different processes. They're measuring, they're forecasting at different levels of aggregation. And all of these factors impact what your, your expected forecast accuracy should be. So in terms of benchmarking, really the best way of going about that is to start tracking your own, um, your own accuracy and consider where you start out as your own baseline. And then as you go forward with your forecasting process, you're comparing yourself to where you start out with your company's data in your forecasting process. And finally, we talked a little bit about this on the roadmap to spot problems early. Um, you might have a SKU which has been traditionally forecasted relatively well, you know, maybe a um, 10 or 20 percent uh, forecast error, and all of a sudden you see a spike in the error, you know, 50 plus percent or something. Something probably happened, and it's something that you probably should be accounting for in your, your forecast model. The, the exercise of going through and looking at the accuracy across the different items is going to actually help you spot and um, control for, for that problem. So how do we measure error? Well, there are three main forms of, uh, of um, error measurement, unit-based, percentage-based, and uh, relative-based. Relative-based, we're gonna talk a little bit more about later in the webinar. So right now, we're gonna really focus on unit-based and percentage-based. And these are the, uh, the two measurements that are most often um, tracked within a um, forecasting software. So in terms of unit-based, the most common measurement, and I am betting that many of you are familiar with this, is what we call MAD, so the mean absolute deviation. And what the mean absolute deviation is doing is it's telling you the average error size in units. So in terms of calculating, it literally is looking at how far off you are each week or each month, each forecast period, and taking an average across the, uh, the periods. Um, and, and that can be very useful. Even more common than that, and you know, probably in virtually all forecasting software, is um, the MAPE or the mean absolute percent error. Similar to MAD, um, except in each forecast period, instead of just telling the average size in units, um, what you're looking at is the average error size as a percent. So you would take that average error size as a percent for each forecast period, and then take the average to get to your MAPE. And we have the exact calculations for MAD and MAPE here. Um, these are here for your reference if you really want an example, um, but we're not going to go into those in details. So which, which do you, should you use, MAPE or MAD? Um, well, there are a couple of things that you're going to want to think about when you're making that decision. Um, the MAPE is appealing, and people really like the MAPE because it's easy to interpret. People like percentages, they have a meaning. If somebody says, you know, my forecast error is 20%, that means something. Um, even if you don't know what the product's demand volume is. But 
the issue with MAPE is once you start having very low volume data, um, the MAPEs can get really big. So if you have a product um, that has, say, a forecast of five and the actual comes in at one, you're looking at a 400% MAPE. Um, and, you know, that, that really stands out. The other issue is, you know, not, not just low volume, but if you actually have zero demand periods, um, you can't really um, calculate MAPE. So MAPE can't necessarily, is not necessarily applicable to all data series. MAD is a good statistic to use when analyzing a single product's forecast um, in large part because you can calculate it for, for any data series. Um, and in terms of a demand forecaster's role, you're, you're in the weeds. You know the, uh, the volume for all your different items. It's right in front of you. So from the demand forecaster standpoint, MAD is going to have some meaning. So another thing you're going to want to think about when um, you're, you're thinking about measuring your forecast accuracy is how, um, how you're going to aggregate error measurements across products. So typically, when you're measuring forecast accuracy, you're not going to be presenting a, an accuracy measurement for every item or every SKU in your process. You want a summary measurement. You want to be taking an average across products. And both MAPE and MAD have um, some, some issues with uh, that aggregation process. For MAPE, um, we, we just talked about how when you have low demand products, you can have very large MAPEs. So we talked about the, uh, if you have a forecast of five and the um, value comes in at one, you have a 400% MAPE. If you're taking a straight average across items, that 400% is going to have a big influence on, on the average MAPE. And that can be problematic, um, particularly because it's likely that a low volume product like that is not one of the more, um, more important products towards your organization. When aggregating MADs, so the mean absolute deviations, it's a little bit of the opposite where high volume products can now dominate the results. Um, so again, you have higher volume, um, you're likely to have much higher um, unit errors than low volume products. Um, does that make sense? And often, you know, that's going to be okay because you know, in many cases, the in most cases probably, it's the high volume products which are more important and you want them to be weighted more than low volume products. But that's not always going to be the case. It could be that a high volume product is much higher value on a per unit basis. Um, and that's also a, a very likely scenario. So a high volume product it has a lower value on a basis and a low vo lower value product would have a higher value. So in that case, um, when you're aggregating MADs, you might want to uh, weight by price. So go from units to dollars and account for the fact that some of the products are more, um, have more value than some of the other products. Um, but that might not account for all of the differences across products. So it could be that some of the products have higher strategic value to the uh, to your organization than others. Um, so it is a good practice to go ahead and um, think about how you want to weight your products when you're averaging or aggregating across them to come up with a summary forecast accuracy number. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Eric to talk about how to track accuracy. Okay. So, again, Sarah sort of set the stage for us, and she has to, to measure forecast accuracy. Um, obviously, we're going, to, we're going to need to look at some sort of statistics. And we're concentrating on the two most common, the MAD and the MAPE, the unit error and the percentage error. So the question is, uh, what are we actually measuring? Okay, so we're, it's error, but what kind of errors are we looking at? One type of error is called a within sample error, and it's really not a forecast error. It's more an indication of how well your forecasting method uh, is tracking the historic data. And so let me uh, give you an example of this, and we're going to just we're going to use Forecast Pro to illustrate most of this. 
Um, for those who've seen our webinar series before, you're probably going to recognize the data we're using. We tend to use the same data set. This is a commercial bakery. Uh, all the data is real. They have two primary product lines. There's cakes and there's muffins. Uh, if we drill down into the cakes, we find the customer level data. So this is the different grocery store chains that they sell their products through. And if we drill down another level, we get into the individual uh, SKUs or stock keeping units. Okay, so consider the following. Um, I'm gonna build a statistical model, a statistical model to generate forecasts. And um, when I do so, I will I'll generate a forecast. So let's let's do that for this item here. Okay, here's a forecast. And I've used a very, very simple approach. I've used a straight line. So I've done sort of a best fit line uh, and I've generated this forecast. Now, there's kind of a question of how did I do that? You know, what is a forecasting model? And how did I fit this straight line? Um, the straight line has an equation. And for those who were paying attention uh, when they were kids in, in school, uh, the equation I learned was y equals mx plus b, okay? And I could use that equation as long as I figure out my, my m and my b, uh, my slope and my intercept, again, for people who are paying attention in grade school, um, I can use that straight line to generate this forecast. I can also use it to show the straight line that goes through the data. Okay, so in addition to the forecast using y equals mx plus b, I can also determine how the straight line goes through the data. How it tracks or goes through the data, uh, another way of saying that is how it fits the data. And this red line that goes through the data is ca are called uh, fitted values. And the fitted values, I can measure the error. So here are my first data point. Okay, this is monthly data. In June, I could measure the difference between that red line and the green line, and I could calculate the error. And I could do the same thing for the next month and the month after that, et cetera. So one thing I could do is to measure the difference between the, gre the green and the red line and measure the error in terms of, say, a mad or a mate. That's called a within sample error. How well are we tracking the data? Now, Here's the straight line forecast. There's a question of, what if we used a different approach, okay? Uh, forecast Pro has something called expert selection, where it automatically uh, will choose a model for you. Um, and if you did that, here's what you would generate. And it, it happens to be, I've run this example before, this happens to be uh, an exponential smoothing model that was selected. Notice that the fit, how we track the history, is very, very different than our first model, which was the straight line. The forecast is also very, very different. So there's, there's a question of, you know, which of these is better, my straight line forecast or this one? And I think most of us would look at this and say, obviously this one is better. And one question is why, why do you say that? And the answer is it fits the data better. It tracks the history better. Now, let's go back to our straight line for a second. And let's look at an actual error measurement. So I'm gonna open up what's called a forecast report here. Um, and I'm gonna scroll down to a section that says within sample statistics. And I'm gonna point out, there's a bunch of different error measurements. As, as Sarah mentioned, the Mad and the MAPE are not the only games in town, but they're the ones we'll concentrate on for the webinar. The MAPE here is 80%. So on average, that difference between that red and green line, we're off by about 80%. In terms of a unit error, the MAD is 6,750. So on average, we're off by 6,750 units. If I look at the same statistics for um, our expert selection model, okay, so I'll scroll down here, we see that the MAPE is 38%. So we went from 80% and we cut the error all the way down to 30, 38%. So a dramatic improvement in terms of the MAPE. The MAD, which had been at uh, 7,500, 
is now down closer to 3,300. So again, a dramatic improvement. But what we're looking at is a within sample error. How well do we fit the history? Um, and here, the, the two models that we're comparing, the differences are dramatic, and we're pretty confident that the second one, the, mo the model on the screen, would be better. Okay, let's go back to our slides for a second. So what about within sample statistics? Well, I think it's within sample statistics are useful and they can really aid when building statistical models and particularly models like regression models where it, you tend to be iterative. You tend to be trying different models and comparing one to another and keeping an eye on the within sample statistics and understanding which models are performing better in terms of within sample fit, I think is useful. But there's a problem here. And the problem is, is that our job as forecasters is not to fit the historic data. Our job as forecasters is to forecast the future as accurately as we can. And those are two different things. It is easier to fit the historic data than to forecast the future. So sometimes people look at a within sample fit and they say, okay, the, the MAPE was 38%, so I can expect that the forecast error should be around 38%. Or you know the MAD was was 3,300, so I could expect that on average we'll be off by 3,300. No, you can't do that. The within sample fit is usually not a good indicator of expected performance. It is because it's easier to fit the historic demand. The actual forecast error is usually larger. Okay, so again, are within sample statistics useful? I think for building models, yes. But for measuring accuracy and expected performance, the answer there is no. Uh, for those, we want to concentrate on not within sample statistics, but rather what's called out of sample statistics. Out of sample statistics measure how accurately you are forecasting. There's a couple of different ways to generate out of sample statistics. One is what we call holdout analysis, and I'll talk about that in a moment. The other is what Sarah referred to as real-time tracking. Some people call it wait and see. <laughs> okay, so I generate a forecast, and now I have a forecast for say the next 12 months, and then I wait until those actuals, the future unfolds, and I can compare the forecast that I generated to what actually happened. That's called real-time tracking, so I'm tracking my forecast in real time, or put another way, I, I generate a forecast and then I wait and see how accurate I was. Okay, so out of sample statistics yield a much better measure of expected forecast accuracy than within sample statistics. Why? Because we're actually measuring forecast errors as opposed to fitted errors, okay? Of the two approaches, which we'll be looking at in just a second, uh, the holdout versus the wait and see or the real-time tracking, the real-time tracking is also superior. And as I, we go through the example, I think you'll see why. So let's first consider this holdout approach. Okay, so in this um, display here, I've taken the series that we were working with before and I've, I've chopped it uh, into two pieces. So we had about four years worth of historic data, that's the green line. And you can see this vertical black line where I've divided um, our history into two pieces. The first three years is what I will call our fit set. I'm gonna use the first three years and forecast the remaining year. And the, the key here is I'm not gonna use that fourth year um, to generate a forecast. I'm just gonna use it to compare what happens when I forecast the first three years. So it's sort of like um, you know, here we are today, and what would we have forecasted a year ago? How close would we have come? Okay, so if I do that, here's a statistical forecast, the red line, which was generated using the first three, three years. And what you can see is when I look at that, um, we're kind of undershooting fairly substantially. Uh, almost all our forecast periods, the red line is below what actually happened. And I think if you look at the data, you can see the first couple of years are pretty small. The second one had an uptick. And it's sort of averaging those. And the forecast is reasonable, but in terms of you know how accurate would that forecast have been if we had done this last year, 
the answer is uh, we would have undershot fairly considerably. Um, so when your, your boss says, how do we do? You say, um, well, we undershot. Okay, what, what would you actually say to your boss? You'd go measure the error. Okay, so now, instead of measuring how we track the data, we're gonna measure this error, the difference between what we forecasted a year ago and what actually happened, okay, or what we would have forecasted a year ago. That's called an out of sample error, and Forecast Pro will calculate that for you in a number of different ways. Um, and this display here is showing both the MAT and the MAPE. And for an overall error, um, what, we're, what we're looking at here is about 31%, okay? Um, so our MAPE is about 31% for our, our holdout analysis. Um, on, the, on the unit error, the MAD, about 3,700. This is actually fairly similar to the within sample errors. Um, and that's, that's a little unusual. Usually we expect the, the out of sample to be, to be a bit higher. In any particular data series, you, you never quite know what you're gonna get, get. So let's go back to our slides for a second and just consider this holdout approach. Um, what's the pros to it? It allows you to compare different approaches, okay? So I can withhold part of my data or hold out part of my data and try different statistical methods and compare them. That's pretty powerful and, um, and, and pretty useful. It provides insight into expected accuracy, okay? Because it is actually forecasting the data. So we're measuring forecast errors um, and it's a better indication of expected accuracy than for example, using the within sample errors. So that's good too. Um, here's a downside though, is that your actual forecasting process may be more than just building a statistical model. Let's say that we've got an SNOP process. So we, you know, the demand planners go and generate forecasts using say Forecast Pro or some other statistical approach. And then those are the subject of meetings with sales people and operations people and management, and maybe some adjustments are made. So simulating um, or doing a holdout sample to um, try different statistical methods is very, very straightforward. But trying to simulate your actual forecasting process that may involve more than just statistical models is more complex. Okay, which leads us to the final way that we can track error, which is in real time. Um, okay, real time tracking uh, has the advantage that it's tracking your actual forecast process. Like within sample and holdout, we're going to have to measure the error. And again, in organizations, using a percent error or unit error are pretty common. It's not the only way, but it is the most common way. Real-time tracking allows you to compare different forecasts and from different sources. So maybe I have a statistical forecast. Um, maybe I also have the salesperson's forecast. Maybe I have a customer-generated forecast. Um, I can compare all of these different forecasts that I have by tracking in real time. Okay. Also, a very common approach uh, to, to in a forecasting process would be to generate a baseline forecast. Maybe that's a statistical forecast and then make adjustments to it uh, to reflect your knowledge of the future that wouldn't be incorporated in the statistical forecast. But put very simply, sometimes we, we make overrides to our statistical forecast uh, in, a, in a judgmental fashion. When we do that, there's a real important question, which is I'm making adjustments, um, you know, judgmental adjustments to statistical forecasts. Am I adding value? Am I making the forecast more accurate by doing so? Or am I not? Am I actually making the forecast less accurate by changing the statistical forecast? By tracking in real time, we can compare the accuracy of just the statistical forecast versus any of the adjusted forecasts that you create. And that's pretty powerful. And if we uh, can, can set that up so that the people making the adjustments have knowledge of where their adjustments are adding value and where they're not, then that can often lead to improvements in your forecasting process as people start spending the human time where it's adding value and letting the statistical methods work uh, all by themselves where the judgment is not adding value. Okay. Finally, real-time tracking. Um, 
as we've stated, it provides the most accurate insight into expected accuracy, um, and that's that's a good thing. So it's the strongest of all the approaches that we're considering in in the webinar. Okay, it also requires uh, more work, and it requires continuity of your forecasting process. So in order to track things in real time, you're going to have to record the forecasts you generate um, in some sort of a database. And we refer to this record of previous forecasts as a forecast archive, okay? And I'm going to show you an example of building a forecast archive. So let's say um, to do so, I'm going to introduce a concept of the forecast origin, which is something we use in Forecast Pro, and you can also see it um, in some of the forecasting literature. But the origin is the last historic data point that you have when making a forecast. So if I have data up to and including December of, of 2019, then my forecast origin is December 2019, and if I'm forecasting on a monthly basis going forward, my first forecast would be for January 2020. And in this example, I've forecasted the next six months. So the origin is December 2019, and I've generated a six-month forecast. Pretty straightforward. Okay, so I take that forecast that I've generated, and I put it into a database. I have the beginning of my forecast archive. Now, what happens? Well, a month goes by, okay? So now we know what we sold in January. That's this green um, number here. So we know what we sold in January. So our forecast origin is gonna roll forward. I can now use data up to and including January of 2020 and forecast six months into the future. So my first forecast point will be for February since again, my origin is now January. The next month, I do it again. So a month later, I now know what February is, so my origin rolls forward to February, and I generate another six-month forecast. So when I've been doing this for three months, my forecast archive has three different forecasts in it. So I'm, I'm starting to record all the forecasts I'm generating and build up a forecast archive. A month later, I can add another forecast to my archive. A month later, I do the same thing. Six months uh, into the process, this is what my archive would look like. So I have six months uh, worth of forecasts that went into my archive from six different starting points or origins. And in terms of the actuals that I know, I know the first six months. So that's the, the green row here. And I can compare the forecasts we generated uh, you know, at, at, for the December origin with what actually happened. For the origin of January, I can I have five forecasts that I can compare to what actually happens. And I think it's pretty clear the further you, the more you build your forecast archive, the more information and the more ways you can compare to uh, things to what actually happened. This display, this sort of upper triangular display here, is part of a report that is often referred to as a waterfall report. And a waterfall report. Um, is a very common way of tracking forecast accuracy, is to build and look at waterfall reports. Rather than looking at the slide, let's, let's jump into Forecast Pro. Uh, forecast Pro does support waterfall uh, reports, and again, so if you've built a forecast archive, you can report on it. Um, my monitor here um, and for the, the webinar is kind of limited um, in terms of resolution. If you've got a big monitor, and I do recommend that if you use Forecast Pro, get a big monitor, you can see more. So you can tell your boss, Eric said, I need a big monitor. So if you've got a small one, just tell him I told him you need to buy you a bigger one. But the tracking report has um, a graph to it, and we don't really have the space. So I'm going to turn that off um, and just concentrate on the on the uh, numeric display of our waterfall report. So the waterfall report is called a waterfall because it has sort of this cascading appearance. Um, and it's really just what we looked at at the last slide. It's comparing what actually happened to forecasts you generated previously. And when you're looking at a waterfall report, the thing to sort of keep in mind is the information is usually viewed either by rows or by what I call diagonals. So if you look at this sort of this purple diagonal um, with the, the highlight there, 
Um, the row corresponds to a specific forecast that was made at a specific point in time. So this first row for the origin December 2019 is again the forecast that was made using data up to and including December 2019 and that row is the forecast that we created at that time. The second row, which is the origin is January 2020, um, is the forecast that we created at that origin. So the rows are corresponding to specific forecasts made at specific periods of time. The diagonals have something in common as well. Um, if you think about this, each of these purple diagonals was a one month ahead forecast. So when we had data up to and including December, we forecasted January. That's a one month ahead forecast. When we had uh, everything up to and including January, we forecasted February. That's a one month ahead forecast. So if I wanna know how accurate are we on our one month ahead forecast, I'd be concentrating on that first diagonal. Um, you can see the third diagonal here, which is sort of highlighted in crimson here, that would say here are three month ahead forecasts. And I can look at the bottom of this report and I can say for all my one month ahead forecasts, on average, we were off by 20%. Um, for my two months ahead, it was more like 22%. For my three months ahead, 26%. So they're getting a little bigger the further we, we go out. And that makes sense. It's, it's easier to forecast close in than further out. This report can be, it's very flexible and there's lots of different things we can do with this report. What I'm showing currently is pretty simple. I'm just showing the actual forecasts that were generated against what actually happened. If I prefer to look at the error directly, I could do that. If I wanna look at the percent error, I could do that. Um, if I want to arrange the display differently, I can. Um, our time in the webinar is pretty limited, so I won't go too deep into this, but what I will say is there's a lot of flexibility here and you can, you can answer a lot of different questions. So for example, we're looking at a specific SKU and how well it performed, but maybe we'd look at a category. You know, How accurate are we for cakes as a whole? How accurate are we for the SKUs that make up cakes? Um, that kind of thing. How accurate are we at a customer level? You can do all of this by, by defining uh, different um, waterfall reports that reflect the information that you want to, to view. So they're very useful reports. They're, they are fairly dense. There's a lot of numbers here. Um, and it, usually what you do is you sit down and you think about what am I trying to measure and how do I set this up to measure it as simply as we can. Okay, so let's go back to our slides. And at this point, I'm gonna turn the presentation back over to Sarah and she's gonna talk a little bit about relative absolute errors. So, I'm jumping ahead of myself there. Um, yeah, so as promised, we're now gonna talk a little bit about some of the um, relative error measurements. And what we're talking about here, um, as an example, is a relative absolute error. So what you're doing um, with relative absolute error is you're comparing um, the error from your forecast to what the error would be if you're using what we call here a naive model. Um, what we mean by a naive model is typically a same as last period model. Um, so the most simple uh, forecasting model you can, you can really use, hence, hence the term naive. Um, unlike the uh, MAD and MAPE, I'm actually gonna take a quick second on this, uh, on this slide here, um, because it does kind of, you know, give the con, a good illustration of the concept and the interpretation of a uh, relative absolute error. So you can see what we're looking at is the ratio for each time period of the actual minus forecast from your forecasting process to the naive one. And the appealing thing about ratios um, is like percents, they're intuitive and they have meaning. So if your forecast was just as, was only as accurate as the naive forecast, this number would be one. If this number is less than one, you're doing better than the naive forecast. If we look at, we're not gonna go through the details of these calculations, but you look at the bottom line here, this 0.77, this means that you're doing 23% better than the naive um, model. So there, there's a um, appealing um, interpretation there, at least in my mind. And, 
these relative error measurements are also very useful for some other very intuitive reports. Um, so one of the uh, reports that um, people really like because it's, um, well, it's really useful is what we call this um, FVA, so forecast value add or stair step report. Um, and this is a concept that was introduced to us by uh, Mike Gilliland um, from SAS. And um, it's really come in handy and people really do seem to like it. Um, the idea of the FVA report is that you want to document the value added or the value destroyed in many cases in each step of your forecasting process. So an FVA report is really going to um, analyze the different steps of your forecasting process and un help you understand um, where where you're doing well and where you're not doing so well. So in this example here, it's a very simple process. There are basically three steps, uh, process steps that we have here. And the starting point is again, the naive forecast. Um, so this is what, you know, ultimately the, the thing that we're comparing all of the uh, forecast iterations to. So in this example, we're starting off with a forecast error of 40%. So on average, the naive model is 40% um, off from what actually happened. So we go from the naive model to producing statistical forecasts. Um, and in this example, once we start using um, more sophisticated statistical models, we see forecast error go down to 35%. So if we compare the FBA um, to the naive, we're looking at a difference of 5%. Um, so unlike the previous slide where we um, were looking at the, uh, the RAE, instead of taking a, a ratio, we're taking the difference between these forecast errors. So then suppose these uh, statistical forecasts are passed on to a demand planner who um, makes some overrides based on their knowledge of the different products. Um, the resulting forecast from after the uh, demand planners made those overrides has a forecast error of 38%. So those forecasts are, there's still value add versus not having forecasting process at all because um, these forecasts are doing 2% better than the uh, naive forecast. But if you look at the, um, difference between the demand planner override and the statistical forecast, we're actually losing value. So relative to the statistical forecast, we're actually losing 3% um, percent of, uh, of accuracy. Um, so at this point, um, if you were trying to tweak your forecasting process, um, instead of, you know, going telling the demand planner to uh, stop making overrides, um, it really would be ideal to start, like start a conversation, start a feedback loop with the demand planner and go a little bit more um, deep into uh, the type of overrides demand planner is making, uh, kind of analyze like which items the demand planner is adding value to, which um, items demand planner is not adding to. And essentially you're going to, you would end up helping the demand planner do a better job of knowing which, um, how, where to add value to the, uh, to the forecast. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about exception reports. And, and this is what we use for spotting problems. So again, um, I'm sure many of you are forecasting lots and lots of different SKUs and items. Um, and you have a lot, of a lot of numbers to sift through, and you need an efficient way of doing that. Exception reports are a good way to reduce, reduce the need for manual review and allow you to focus on the items where human attention is, uh, is most needed. So let's actually jump back to the product. And again, we're looking at our favorite bakery data. So within Forecast Pro, we have a number of different exception reports. What we're looking at here is what we call the forecast accuracy exception report. And what, uh, what this report shows us is each row is a different end item. Um, we could be including group levels and things like that if we wanted, but in, in this case, we're just looking at the uh, customer SKUs here. And then 
over here we have some accuracy measures. So the idea here is we want to be looking at how well we forecast last month. And in this case, last month was the futurist um, June of 2020. So suppose it's now July 2020, and we're looking back at how well we did in June of 2020. Um, there are a couple columns here. Um, we have a column that shows what actually happened in June 2020. And then the next column shows us what we forecasted would happen in June 2020. We have our error measurement over here, the, um, our unit deviation. And then we also have percent deviation. And we have gone ahead and sorted the, um, all the items by the largest percent deviations down to the smallest based on an absolute um, value level. So at the top here, you can see that there are a bunch. And actually, I'm going to very quickly just put in a heat map because it really makes how big these errors are stand out. Um, but you can see that all four of these red percent deviations, meaning that these are the very biggest by a lot, are muffins from Stuff Mart. Um, and that really, that, that's a big red flag, and hence the red on our exception report there. Um, and yeah, there's a really, there, there's a question, what happened in, uh, with muffins and Stuff Mart? Um, and actually, I'm going to quickly open up graph and arrange that nicely here. And one of the things that you can do um, with these exception reports is you can graphically view the items as you um, click on them. So if we look at this example here, um, you can visually see the miss that we have for Stuff Martin June um, pretty clearly. Um, just to clarify, the blue line here is the forecast that we made last month. The red line is the current forecast we would be making this month, and the green is the history. So the forecast that we made last month is significantly off from what actually happened. And um, you know, somewhat more alarming is our new forecast, which now incorporates this historic value, doesn't look so great. It's flat for what is probably a seasonal item, and it looks pretty dramatically different from what we did forecast last um, last month. So this, this is a concern. And the first thing that you're going to want to do here is you're going to want to figure out what, what happened with Muffins and Stuff Mart, um, because that is going to have a big impact on what you should do about your forecast going forward. So if you went and you asked the, uh, who, whoever's in charge of Stuff Mart Muffins, you know, what happened, and they said, oh, a bunch of the stores closed, then this point down here could be your new normal. It could be that you have had a level shift and you can never expect uh, Stuff Mart sales to be as high as they um, traditionally have been. This forecast would have to incorporate that level shift appropriately. But suppose you, all, you, you went and you found out, oh, there was some catastrophe in the Stuff Mart bakery and you know muffins were just completely destroyed and you couldn't sell them. So uh, it, this was a one-time event and you don't want it to have an impact on your, your forecast. So I know that this is not a webinar on event models, but just to see like how much you can improve your process with that, if we, I have actually created an event schedule for this already that just takes into account this last point as a, an outlier. And you can see that our new forecast, now that we've taken into account that something weird happened um, this, uh, this month in Stuff Mart, our new forecast looks much more like what we, what we would expect. So with that, let's go back to the slides here and quickly summarize what we've talked about. Um, so in terms of conclusions, um, first, tracking forecast accuracy allows you to improve your forecasting process, gain insight into expected performance, benchmark, and spot problems quickly. Um, and then we talked a little bit about the pros and cons of the different error measurements. We looked at unit error measurements, um, we looked at percentage error me measurements and relative error measurements, um, and you know some of the things that you're going to want to think about when uh, when making some choices. Um, we also looked at out of sample um, performance and really um, 
bottom line is that out of sample performance, particularly real time tracking is really the best way to uh, uh, come up with a measure of expected forecast accuracy going forward so that you can tell people the right plus or minus that you uh, expect around your forecast. And finally, um, we just did exception reports and they can be um, really useful for figuring out problems and uh, addressing those problems in your forecasts. So in terms of best practices, um, uh, certainly the, the real-time tracking is a best um, practice and that involves establishing a forecast ac um, archive and, and routinely tracking your accuracy. Um, we looked a little bit at the uh, FDA reports um, and that really emphasizes that ideally you want to track every step in your forecasting process to determine what is adding or destroying value. And again, the, um, the forecast value add report is a really nice and easy way to do that and gives you something to take to management. Establish a feedback loop to allow participants to learn and improve. That is really critical to um, you know, continuous improvement in your forecasting process. Monitor for changes in forecast accuracy and take action when necessary. And then finally, understand the differences among error measurements and choose appropriate metrics for the, uh, for the task at hand. Um, so with that, I'm actually going to turn it back over to Eric to uh, take us through some of the events we have in the uh, next several months. Yeah, so um, just first a reminder, uh, we are recording today's webinar and we will post it on the webinar archive that's found on Forecast Pro. Um, this is the Forecast Pro website and I just wanted to point out there's a resources menu. Uh, the webinars are here, they're uh, free, they're on demand. We probably have maybe 20, 20 to 25 hours of recorded content. Um, and again, there's all sorts of different topics, designing and implementing, improving your forecasting process. Here's one on replenishment mo models, on the role of judgment. Here's one on regression. But um, a lot of people sort of forget that they're here. So if there are topics you wanna learn more about, uh, visit the resources on the website. Um, we also do have some upcoming events, which I'll talk about in a second. There's also a blog and a LinkedIn community. So if these are things you're interested in, I encourage you to visit uh, the website. In terms of events, um, we have a forecasting workshop that's coming up in, in May. It's gonna be held in Amsterdam. Uh, it's a, it's a three-day workshop, and it, you usually have 20 to 25 people. Um, you'll have a chance to bring your own data uh, to, to work on. We'll go through the different forecasting methods in Forecast Pro, which are again chosen to be the most uh, useful of the business-oriented forecasting techniques. We'll explain how they work, we'll talk about how to apply them, and we'll use a lot of real data in terms of illustrating how, how to, uh, to effectively use them to generate forecasts. Um, it's also usually because, they, again, a pretty small group uh, will be working with attendees' data um, and be gaining insights into how to improve uh, their ongoing processes. Um, later in September of this year, we're gonna hold the Forecast Pro User Conference. It'll be, hold, uh, be held in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, not too far from our offices here. And um, it's, the user conference is always a lot of fun. Um, this one is gonna be held at a very nice facility that's part of MIT. It's overlooking the Charles River. Uh, we're going to limit it to 100 people. We did sell out our last user conference, so if you are interested, I'd encourage you to sign up early, and you can do so on the website. Um, we spend uh, two and a half days uh, doing forecasting stuff, you know, so we have tutorials, we have users who describe how they built their processes, uh, we've got educational sessions where we talk about um, different methods and how to apply them, we have panels of experts, uh, we have cocktail parties and things like that. So again, um, if you're actively using Forecast Pro, want to get more out of it, I uh, would encourage you to, to attend the conference. We'd love to see you there. Okay, um, finally, I do want to mention, you've probably noticed that we've been using uh, Forecast Pro uh, to illustrate everything in our webinar. 
Um, the, if you're interested in learning more about Forecast Pro, we'd love to, to uh, help you learn more. Probably the best way is to get a live WebEx-based demo. Um, and actually, if you can even use the chat facility on the uh, webinar software to send us a note saying you're interested and, and we'll have uh, one of our sales guys get back to you in the range of time. And the demos can use your own data. Uh, if you're not quite ready for a demo but, but want to learn more, visit the website. There's some recorded uh, videos on there. We can also set you up with a trial version. But again, if you're not using Forecast Pro and want to learn more about it, uh, we're here to help. And you may have noticed that during the webinar, um, for those who are using Forecast Pro, that the product might have looked a little different. Uh, we were using Forecast Pro Track version 6, which uh, will be released very shortly. Um, so that if you're using Forecast Pro Track, you'll probably be notified about uh, version 6 probably in the next month or so. Um, so that's coming your way. So at this point, um, we have a little bit of time for questions. And Aiden, do we have any questions? Yes. So the first question we have here is, should I regularly use holdout analysis? Okay. So I guess I'll, I'll take the first one. Sure. You can have the second one. Um, I would say the, the, the question is, is framed as regularly. I think holdout analysis is useful. And I think it can be useful for a couple of different things. One, one is to determine an approach to forecasting. So if I've got a couple of different, you know, maybe I'm considering event models and I'm considering uh, expert selection, then uh, doing a holdout might be a pretty good way of, of comparing and contrasting approaches. So it's not so much that I'm using it on, a, on an ongoing basis, I'm using it for specific analysis to determine uh, whether a method might be used. The other thing I could do is to do it periodically um, as a way of trying to get at expected performance, to be looking at error measurements. So holdout analysis is not something that typically is part of every single forecast period. It's more in terms of deciding upon approaches and occasionally sort of coming up with expect expectations in terms of accuracy. The only two things that I would add to that, um, you'll see that we, we usually with questions, we kind of bounce back and forth a little bit like this. Um, but one thing about holdout analysis is you need enough data to really be able to do holdout analysis. If you're dealing with only two years of data as a start, um, holdout analysis is more difficult because once you start holding it out, you lose your ability to measure seasonality. So that so that's something that you have to uh, you, you have to think about and balance. Um, and the other thing that I just wanted to uh, make sure everyone is aware of is if you are using expert selection, uh, which those of you who are not familiar with the uh, Forecast Pro, expert selection is kind of our um, um, our, our automatic AI driven um, selection, model selection uh, um, mechanism. Uh, um, expert selection will automatically be doing multiple holdout samples for you. Um, so if, if that's the approach that you're using, um, holdout analysis is not going to hold add a whole lot over what we're already doing in that algorithm. Okay, and so waterfall reports in Forecast Pro have MAPE and MAD as statistics in there, which were discussed as within sample statistics. Um, but the waterfall report is, of course, showing out of sample statistics. Um, so is it possible to display holdout analysis statistics in the waterfall report format? Okay, so just a couple of clarifications there. Um, all of the statistics displayed in the waterfall report are actually out of sample statistics because they're all comparing what actually happened against previously generated forecasts. Okay, so um, the other question though was can we do a holdout analysis and display it in terms of a waterfall? Um, there, I'm trying to think of that. You actually can. Um, it requires using a part of Forecast Pro that most people don't know about, okay? And under here, under operations, um, there's something, I think it's a new product, so I have to make sure I'm actually <laughs> pointing to the right spot. But there's a, there's a simulate archive, and 
for version five, it used to be called initialize archive. And it basically generates a forecast archive using a holdout approach. So the quick answer there, I think, is yes, you can. Okay, we are pretty much at the end of our time frame for the webinar. Um, and so I think at this point, what I'd like to do is to remind you that if you ask questions that we weren't able to answer live, you'll be receiving an email um, with the responses. And I wanna thank everybody for taking an hour out of their day to join us on this webinar. And remind you, it is a quarterly series, so we'll be informing you of when we do our next live one. And if there are topics you may have missed, uh, please visit the archive to catch up on those. But again, thanks to everyone for joining us and hope to see you, uh, so to speak, at a future uh, webinar uh, sometime soon.